the Prodigy Maker Show, episode 57. If I got that right, it's been a while, guys. It's been about a month since the last broadcast. I apologize for that. Tonight, I'm going live on YouTube, and I want to talk about attacking the net the Spanish way, which is different than the way other people attack the net in other countries. And I thought that would be an inter interesting topic to share with you. Also, I just want to talk about some of the common mistakes that I see in my players, especially younger players, uh, in terms of attacking the net, when to attack the net, the decisions that they make, and how to best coach the net game. I don't think I'm going to delve too much into technique unless you guys have specific technical questions. Because we're live tonight, you can feel free to shoot me any questions or comments that you have, and I'd, be, of course, be happy to answer that. I like that interaction, but I'm going to try to riff and talk about, you know, the way I like to teach kids to go to the net and especially how they do it in Spain. And I think I do teach that way because I've just spent so many years learning in Spain. It's just like part of my DNA now. But, you know, if you were a kid uh, on my training court either in a private lesson or in a class in, in the academy, in a program, you know, how, how would I teach you uh, to go to net? And, and in what context would I teach you to go to net? I think it's very important to train kids um, a certain way and not to train kids irres to go to net irresponsibly. And maybe we should start with that. That is a very common term that you hear from um, I think the best Spanish coaches, for example, Jose Higueras, who is one of my mentors, has, has had a really big influence on my coaching career. Got a chance to study with him a lot through the USDA. He says that you should only go to net responsibly. Uh, you should only go to net selectively. And I think that is sort of the heart of what it means to attack the net in the Spanish way. So... You know, maybe we should kind of start there. What does it look like to go to net irresponsibly? And so I talk about that with a lot of kids. For example, I have students. Here are some of the, let me break down like a few of the things that I see. You have some students who are hyper aggressive and they try to attack the net at every opportunity, including every short ball. I like to tell you guys that not every short ball should be taken to net. You can kind of talk more about that. Uh, sometimes that's a trap. And some kids are hyper aggressive, whether that's uh, part of their personality or the way they were coached is, um, you know, that could be part of the factor. A lot of coaches in the U.S., especially that uh, in my neck of the woods in the northeastern U.S., indoors, a lot of the time of the year, faster courts in general. A lot of the coaches in the U.S. in my area are teaching kids that points should almost always be finished at the net and that every short ball should be attacked and that the player should take the ball um, very early all the time, which may sound like to you What's wrong with that? It sounds exactly right. Probably a lot of you are shaking your heads and saying, well, that is very good advice. Uh, I will be doing a show, another live show tomorrow morning, hopefully, if I can get into the, uh, over to the club. I'm, I'm here in Vermont right now at my house. This is also Baby Ocean's little um, room. I have a little toddler. And so she has this adorable little room in my house. It also serves as my wife's remote uh, workspace. And sometimes I'll do some filming in here because the lighting's pretty good, actually. And the acoustics are pretty good in this little room. But if you wondered what's going on behind me, uh, this is my daughter's room. And uh, tomorrow I would like to get over to the club and, and film a show from our, uh, like the classroom that I have there. By the way, I'm kind of excited because. Um, trying to organize uh, more more of these shows. I know some of you have been really sad. You sent me some emails about how you need more of the more content, more more uh, podcasts, and um, more of these live shows. We're going to be doing more of that. 
and I as uh, we're trying to professionalize the show and get better audio, uh, get me hooked up to a better mic uh, and uh, better lighting and better film quality. I'm looking to hire a videographer to help with a lot of the film projects we have uh, moving forward. We're also doing, it's kind of an aside, but uh, my plan is to create almost, almost like a professional film studio at our club, uh, get some good uh, video and audio equipment in there so we can film not only in the classroom, we have a, a wonderful classroom that also doubles as uh, one of our gym spaces at the club. So we have the classroom that I want to set up with a whiteboard. We already have a big screen TV to show video and I can film in there anytime and we can start you know, adding better and better content for YouTube and other uh, social media platforms from, you know, direct from the classroom. I really enjoy that. I enjoy teaching from the classroom. And then also I'm trying to set up a, a camera array on one of our indoor courts at the club, and that can be a dedicated filming court so I can, you know, stream live lessons and practices for you guys and also film uh, more content for our digital courses and digital library that we have at clta.teachable.com. So I want to keep building that online uh, school platform. And just in general, whenever I have good players in town visiting, like top national players or uh, players with interesting technical issues that we're working on, or if we're training a certain Spanish method, I think it'll be really interesting to capture those moments and to broadcast them or, or, or save them and and edit them into uh, nice videos for, that you guys can enjoy. So you can kind of be there on the court with me or be there in the classroom with me if you can't make it to Manchester, Vermont, where we're at. So those are some of my ideas. I want to, you know, I'm putting together kind of a business plan for that in the next, for coming up for this year. Also, another uh, aside and news for you guys who have, who are big fans of the show, that uh, I'm working with my assistant to get finally to finally get the one of the new books out uh the the little book of spanish tennis wisdom it's a really cool book project that i started pre-pandemic everything got thrown in the blender because of the pandemic well, i guess i'll blame the pandemic but champions shouldn't make excuses anyway uh the little book of spanish tennis wisdom we're working on that draft and we're going to try to get that out soon uh in addition we have another uh, sort of a trilogy planned with uh, Spanish Tennis Tactics, which is another book project that I've been uh, has been on my computer, kind of throwing some ideas around, and I just need to get uh, busy and uh, organized and get uh, that project going as well. So eventually, if things go according to plan, we should have a trilogy of uh, Secrets of Spanish Tennis, the classic, as you guys know, Great book if you have not read it. Come on, guys. Awesome book on, on um, you know, what makes Spanish tennis unique and the whole training system there. And I, I am planning to do a Secrets of Spanish Tennis uh, updated edition, second edition. Uh, we'll have the little book of Spanish tennis wisdom, which is filled with basically all of the wisdom that I've collected from the best minds in Spain over the last... 13, 14 years of traveling there. So uh, it, it will be um, a short book of quotations with maybe some editorial uh, analysis and insight and some also uh, some of the uh, great pictures that I've collected over, the, over all my trips to Spain uh, of some of the legends and different places where I've traveled and studied. I think it's going to be a really cool book. It'll be a great book for coaches and parents. Um, organized into different sections that so it's so it's searchable and it's a great way to help your child or help one of help a player develop sort of the spanish mentality and to immerse a player in sort of the spanish the the way the spanish um, tr train and and develop the the mind and the personality of a kid i think it'd be very useful for a coach or a parent to, uh, to learn from and just anyone else who's curious about the philosophy and um, the wisdom that Spanish coaches uh, share and have. I think it's going to be really cool. Anyway, 
Maybe we can package all three books as a trilogy. That would be really cool. Anyway, getting back to the topic of the show. Thank you for enduring uh, that aside. But I have uh, I'm kind of excited about some of these projects that are on tap that are on the on the on deck. So thought I'd share that with you guys. Uh, players that I see, okay, on the court. If you come to train with me, um, it, it's either you have like this spectrum. Uh, I lost that comment. Can you please uh, send that comment again, and I'll be happy to answer it. We have a one uh, comment on the board. Let's see. I'm new to my YouTube app, and it's not like Facebook where the comment doesn't. It's not staying. The comment went away. So can you throw that up there again? And maybe I have to fix my settings here, but I'll be happy to answer that. Throw that comment up again, buddy. Thanks. Anyway, uh, students usually it's like di like a diametrically. Uh, at, at different different sides of the spectrum. We have on one end of the spectrum players who never come to net, so they're averse to the net, which is bad, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum it's bad because they're not, you know, uh, they're not jumping on opportunities. But on the other end of the spectrum you have players who uh, are hyper-aggressive, and that's what I was alluding to earlier, and I think that is equally bad, but it doesn't seem to be judged as bad in the U.S. and also probably in some other countries too. Uh, any country that has fast courts, like you know, Australia, think of like grass, or anywhere that plays indoors a lot, like Northern Europe or Eastern Europe, or anywhere with carpet, or you know, any anywhere where the courts are quick, you you're going to get a lot of coaches and players who gravitate toward the net and teach going to the net aggressively, which is not, it's not wrong. It's, it's not, it, it's only bad if it's, ir it's irresponsibly done. So can a player come to net aggressively? Sure. But it should be in general after structuring a point well, you know, good serve, good return, some element of ground strokes, a rally, maybe some of you guys have heard of that word. It's kind of a dirty word sometimes for juniors. A good a rally with good movement, good footwork, um, good positioning. And then as that rally builds, usually there is an opportunity to move forward to the net. So what I just described is how a lot of kids are taught in Spain, how they, how they are taught to attack the net. The net... The, the net comes with uh, responsibility. It's something that has to be earned. It's not a, you don't have a right to go to net. You have to earn your way to the net. It's not something that you can just um, uh, haphazardly or over, over aggressively do. Uh, so that, that is not often taught here in the U.S. I don't see coaches teaching that way by and large. Most of the kids whom I see on the court are, if they're the hyper-aggressive kid, they are taught uh, that pretty much um, if they choose to go forward, it's a good thing. It's always positive. Now, there's like never a negative. And that anything that's uh, short, like around the service line or mid-court, uh, they should jump on that and make a quick transition to the net, which um, it may work, you know, in certain situations against certain players on 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 maybe on a fast fast really fast court it it can work, but it often doesn't work and it's a foolish strategy for, uh, many times depending on the opponent. So what I like to teach my students is be responsible, just like this like they do in Spain. You know, what if you want to go to net, you got to earn that with good movement, good footwork from the baseline, a well structured uh, rally good quality return, you know, like return plus one, uh, and serve plus one. All right. Uh, got the comment again, I guess on, on YouTube, the comment goes away. Uh, thank you for the comment about the question is about great base tennis. Uh, are you referring to Steve Smith? My friend, uh, I've been asked that a lot. Um, I, I like a lot of things that Steve Smith uh, talks about, I like that he's very technical. I, I like 
you know, that he believes in building world-class technique for young kids and he's, he has a very technical focus. I also have a very technical focus, so I appreciate that. So I, I'm always interested in what Steve's doing. Uh, maybe some of you are familiar with Steve Smith. He's a very, in general, very well-respected coach. He's um, uh, like an elder statesman coach, uh, has a, a website called Tennis Smith, uh, has very good um, technical knowledge, and he uh, trained with uh, uh, who was his mentor? Uh, you know, he, he does a lot of biomechanics. And uh, sorry, his mentor slips my mind at the moment. But anyway, uh, he's developed a lot of good players. His, his son is an excellent player, uh, AT, uh, ATP ranked player, for example. So he's got a lot of knowledge and experience. Unfortunately, after, after saying all that, I, I don't like some of the, the technique that Steve teaches because I, I think it's a little stiff. And some of it's a little too traditional. So that would just be my 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 opinion. Um, I don't like to talk negatively on this show about you know um, other coaches or anything like that. But just my take is a really um, a really knowledgeable guy, a very good technical focus. But I what I've seen from a lot of his content and uh, the way he teaches is I think it, it's it's yeah there. So James, is it James or James, James or James, I'll just, James uh, says, uh, you know, it's kind of robotic. I do feel that way, that the way he teaches is a bit robotic and stiff. And I just wish, it, it just goes against the way that I, I've seen players taught in Spain, where they're taught to be more fluid and elastic and uh, to build like tremendous racket head speed, that's a that's a big thing that I uh, big takeaway from Spain is developing racket speed and and fluidity and and um, elasticity, and I just don't see that as uh, I don't see that being taught in his system. But you know, excellent coach, you know, developed a lot of good players, um, very you know very regimented, uh, very very rote style of repetitive learning. You know, I, I don't know if I agree with everything the, that he's teaching uh, in, in the technical department. And, um, you know, that's all I'd like to say about that. But, you know, very well-respected coach. Um, and thank God somebody's focusing on technique out there. You know, there's so few coaches that are experts and, um, you know, really emphasizing world-class technique. I agree with Steve when he says that um, that technique is so important for tennis players, especially young tennis players to learn and how it should be kind of like martial arts. I'm a big martial artist. So, uh, Steve makes that analogy a lot between learning tennis technique and, and martial arts. I believe he's one of the coaches who promoted the idea of like a belt system for, for kids to earn different skills. I think that's kind of a cool idea actually, but, uh, you know, kids. A lot of kids do not get uh, really good technical training when they're young, and then they suffer later with flaws, and and um, they don't achieve their full potential. So I, I agree with Steve hundred percent on that kind of thing. So getting back to the net, going to the net, man. I, I just wish that uh, I don't know if it's outdated. It might be outdated teaching. Like it's a philosophy of. Maybe from the 70s, like when everything was grass courts, 80s. It's like a 70s, 80s mentality where you, you tell a kid that maybe, it, maybe it's an American mentality, like an American ph philosophical thing. It's, it's basically a point, a point should be won in a certain way. You, you hit a big serve, you, you serve in volley, you uh, go to net as soon as possible, as immediately as possible. And you, you crash the net, you know, like Russian crush. And you're going to get passed a lot. You're going to lose a lot of points up there. But there's this holy grail, like shining light at the end of the tunnel that if you can get uh, over 50% win percentage on those points, you, uh, you are the big, you are the big uh, hero. Uh, you are the winner for the, for the day. I don't think that's the way it works anymore in tennis. It might have worked that way on grass in the 1970s and the early 80s, maybe the late, even mid to late 80s on some surfaces, fast surfaces. Uh, I don't teach my students that anymore. I think it's, it's, it is an outdated 
uh, philosophy that is still like it, it, it will not die. And so I see a lot of kids who come to me and they're playing like that and it's a nightmare. Like they're losing a lot of points at the net. And even if they're winning like 50% of the net approaches or more, they're still losing the match. Uh, also with young kids, when they're, when they're little, you know, they don't have, they don't have a long wingspan. They, they're not generally tall when you're younger. It, it is, uh, a fool's errand if you're small to run to the net and think that you're going to win a lot of points up there. It, it's not a good strategy. Um, unless you do it responsibly. So I have all these discussions with young kids, especially the ones who are taught to be hyper aggressive. Uh, I remember in Spain, Luis Bruguera used to chastise some of the students in the academy who were small and running to net haphazardly. And he would say to them, essentially, look at yourself in the mirror. You are small. You don't have, you're not tall. You have short arms. How are you going to cover this ginormous net you know he would pose that question to to some of the young kids whether they're visiting kids to spain or or they're you know spanish kids and that was one of that was an important question that he used to ask young children and you know it, it, it's, it's a good debate that you can have here because i do think that it is a viable strategy to go to net i certainly would not teach a kid the other way um, the ones who play back by the fence and never take uh, take risk. They never take risk on. They never um, take. They never make someone pay for a short ball. That's, uh, as I mentioned, an, an equally poor uh, strategic approach. That, that that actually wins a lot in juniors. Um, which would I prefer? I'd probably prefer. <laughs> I'd probably prefer the kid who's really steady and solid and winning lots of national junior tournaments and dominating from way back and encourage them to uh and, and like teach them to learn how to be selectively more aggressive and to be responsive and to responsibly attack the net i think i would much prefer to have a kid like that than as a young kid you know under 10 under 12 under 14 then flip the other way around and we can ha probably have a good debate about this but i would prefer to have a kid like that who's solid who knows how to be patient who is um, moving well from the baseline and demonstrating good stamina and endurance and footwork and, and movement patterns. I would like to have a kid like that because that to me is the foundation of a good game. The, you know, maybe they're a little conservative. I would rather take a kid who's a bit more conservative and try to, to make them more aggressive and teach them how to attack than to have a kid who is hyper-aggressive, cannot sustain a rally, does not know how to move, doesn't have good movement patterns, doesn't have endurance. I think it would be much better for me to have the, the, the first kid. And if I had a choice, I would probably train a kid to be a bit more conservative, especially at a young age, because I feel you can teach the net game at a later date, uh, and you don't need to force the net game early. That's another myth or teaching philosophy that I disagree with. A lot of American coaches, a lot of coaches in my area, Northeastern U.S., a lot of coaches from countries where the courts are fast or they have a history of, of, of uh, going to the net, like in Australia and then, you know, Eastern and Northern Europe, uh, not Spain, not Argentina, you know, not clay court dominated countries, clay court where they have countries that have a lot of clay courts you almost never see the type of kid that i'm talking about whether it's partly because of the surface the surface is slow and the kid if the kids try to play that style they lose you know uh they lose a lot of matches in tournaments or you just have the you know the history and the the philosophy of the coaches are, are usually got are guiding those kids to be more conservative and more responsible in uh when they choose to go to that but I think I would rather have the, uh, the ones that are more patient. And that is the, you know, part of the Spanish way is attacking the net with more patience, attacking the net with more responsibility and more selectivity. 
I think that is a mature way to work on the net game. The idea of taking a young kid and starting them at the net um, and, and teaching them uh, to be um, to shorten points really quickly at a young age, I think is, is usually counterproductive and detrimental to a young kid. I, I like to see a young kid who's developing patience and stamina, not only physical stamina, but like mental endurance and uh, a willingness to go deeper in the rallies. And then when the opportunity uh, arises, they, they see the short ball, they set up the short ball with, with their best shot. Usually that is going to be the forehand and they attack the, the net with a powerful shot, maybe a powerful topspin shot. And usually you make sure to attack the opponent's weaker side. So that is definitely the Spanish way to play. The Spanish uh, way to attack the net is you, you make the return, you make a good serve, you get the plus one going, the first ball, you get some additional rallies going, you see if the opponent's going to make an error. If they don't make an error, you work the point like a boxer. You know, you start working the body, bam, bam, bam. Start, you know, you take out the player's body and then the head falls later. You don't go head hunting like you know some boxers are are very hyper aggressive they start swinging for the for the for the the head shot when they really need you know more disciplined boxers are i do a lot of boxing more disciplined boxers are you know combos in and out working the working the body trying to um you know s sustain some uh, you know pr give some get some damage going before they try to go in for the knockout or the or uh, a headshot and I think it's just the, the same you know, I see the tennis court the same way as uh, as uh, that boxing metaphor you want to have a uh, teach your players to be disciplined they should go for the body blows what are the body blows those are the ground strokes those are the, the you know you try to take the legs out from your opponent or if it's MMA I do a lot of MMA you, you want to you know low leg kicks uh, kicks to the lower body, take out the legs, and then later the head's going to fall. You know, you start, you can start working those power shots upstairs. But, you know, you kind of go downstairs. And downstairs in tennis is the legs, is the movement, moving the ball around, moving your opponent left and right, maybe moving your opponent deep. Uh, and then after you've, you've worked the point with some discipline, then it's great to, to look to attack. So how do they attack in Spain? With the forehand. It's 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 a four it's the forehand baby, as you know Nick Politeri would probably say. It, it, um, Nick's funny. Uh, you use the forehand as your entry, uh, your ticket to the net to, for a successful net voyage. You get that ticket, and you 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 earn that you earn that entry to the net with the big forehand. You rip that forehand from the midcourt, you look for it, you look to set it up, you rip it with topspin, you rip it with pace, and then you follow it in. And then instead of having like 50-50 success rates at the net or 55-45, you, you end up with like 65 or 70%, you know, six, seven, uh, eight out of 10 uh, moves to the net are, are in your favor. Those are the statistics that I think you see with people like like Rafa. You know, Rafa's a good guy to watch. He's been attacking the net more recent. You know, in the last in recent years, he's been more aggressive. Um, he's been taking the ball more early. Uh, tomorrow, I want to do another show, episode fifty eight. If I'm counting those right, on how do the Spanish teach on the rise? You know, and how how do you how, how do you take the ball early in terms of court position the Spanish way and and th those are real that that topic is is directly related to this topic how do you get to net because your court position will eventually will will dictate your ability to go to the net uh, so how do they do that in Spain I mean how early should you take the ball and where should you where should you strive to position yourself on the baseline to make uh, that transition to the net I'd like to talk about that more t in tomorrow's show which will be uh, another episode for the podcast. But, uh, you know, tonight is about the volley and about how, um, you know, the, the essential Spanish perspective on, on the net. 
And another way to think about it is, is the net always a positive? You know, is the net always a place where you're going to be the big winner? And that, to me, is one of the biggest myths in maybe in junior development right now, at least in, in the U.S., in places that teach a hyper-aggressive net strategy. The, one of the biggest myths in junior development is that you should, A, always take a short ball to the net. Why is that a bad idea? Because sometimes it's a trap. Smart players, especially good counter punchers, they would leave a ball short on purpose. A lot of fast counter punchers like when you attack them and come to the net. So if you have a uh, if you teach a kid or if you're a player and you always you teach a kid to always go to the net whenever they get a short ball, you could be teaching them to fall into a, a trap, you know, to fall for an opponent's trickery. Uh, and I just think that's never taught, like, or very rarely taught. I, 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 think I work with hundreds of kids, and I, I talk to them about that kind of thing, and they're, they're looking at me like, uh, like I'm crazy, or, or uh, they like, like, uh, or I'm a genius, or like, and they never heard of something like that before in their life, because most of the clubs that they've been going to, everywhere they go, the net is is like this golden, um, this place with with. Uh, gold and silver and 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 trophies and riches and it's like this 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 uh, paradise where you always are you always are rewarded and i just think that is a myth is it's a myth there i've played guys on the pro circuit i play guys in college they, they, if you come to net against them all the time they just they eat you up they eat you up with their passing shots you know i know that from personal experience and um I know it from from what you know from my years coaching juniors. It's just, especially when you're small. If you're if you want to be a top twelve and under, you know, national winner or or uh, fourteen, even fourteen and under. I mean, if you're not uh, real tall, long wingspan, very quick, it's hard to make a living at the net. And you have, to, you know, I would much rather see uh, fewer total net approaches with a higher percentage you can talk about it statistically you can use you can talk about this in terms of uh, uh, you know data analysis you know or, uh, the 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 amount of approaches should probably be less and the winning percentage should be higher for mo for most kids especially young kids so so you can you can look at the data and you can all you can analyze it that way too so a, a Spanish approach would be fewer probably fewer total net approaches because the player is being more judicious and uh um J uh, my buddy here is it james what, what's your first name bro let me know your first name he says what should you do with that short ball so to answer that question this is a little tricky on youtube because the the comments roll in but they don't stay up so i uh i'm just getting the hang for haven't haven't gone live on YouTube in a while. Thank you for uh, joining the show, buddy. And uh, let me know your first name next time. But what do you do with a short ball? So short ball, if it's, if, you know, three quarters of the midcourt with forehand, Spanish way. You look for the forehand. Like, t yeah, James, thanks, buddy. So um, it's nice to have your comments on the show. And as we start doing more shows on YouTube, I think we'll, we have a pretty good YouTube following. So I think we'll get more people tuning in. Anyway, sometimes uh, in past shows, we get a nice discussion going, lively uh, debate. But um, if you get a short ball, it's got to be forehand. Like, that's what I teach the young kids. Very rarely do you want to approach with the backhand. And very rarely do you want to approach with a slice. So that's another, you know, common myth that I see. You guys can debate me on it. I'm sorry, but uh, this is an old, old teaching style. Like, you know, to slice and follow the slice in for the volley. Then you volley deep, and then you look to maybe volley short. Like, this pattern is just, doesn't exist. It, it, it exists very rarely. I'm just going to, I'm not going to say never, but you, you you can approach with a slice on a very fast court, and if you really knife the slice, like you have an amazing slice, it can work. Of course, it can work, but it's just not a, a vi it's, it's not a common or viable pattern anymore. Uh, that's going to score you a ton of points. Usually, especially on a slower court, if you try to slice 
and go to net on a slower court, you almost always get burned. Guy dips it at your feet. Guy passes you. He's got too much time to set up. Uh, so that that's another myth that I see in terms of the uh, the net games. I've never seen a Spanish coach teach that. Like like a, the slice move in. That's like an Australian grass court thing. That's like a, you know like an Eng, Eng, in England. Like like I said, Northern Europe. You know like England, Australia. Uh, and then Northern European countries, like with carpet, maybe like you know, like Sweden or Norway or you know whatever they got up there. Indoor, indoors, a lot of time, you know, fast indoors, anywhere with indoor hard. Eastern Europe, you know, Croatia, see a lot, of, a lot of attacking the net. With and the slice can work a little better, but like that, that, that's like taking every short ball and going to the net. If you teach a kid that, it, it's, it's. Uh, it's not right. It's not the right way to coach a young kid. Um, James is saying forehand to their back and then run back to the baseline. Um, sure, it's just it's just forehand and then look for more forehands until you until you destroy the other player or you take one of those big forehands and you do follow it in to the net. You and and typically you want to set up the forehand against someone's backhand, but if they have a better backhand, then you you know you have to, you want to attack the other side. Uh, that's the other thing I, I see a very common myth of uh, players attacking the to the middle. You know that that that's like you know straight out of like the nineteen seventies uh, handbook. Like you like slice up the middle. Like you know take away the angles. You know I was taught that when I was a kid too. But like who does that anymore? Like basically you get a short ball, you rip you rip the shit out of it with top, with good topspin for mar for a control. So it's a heavy heavy attack. You pick a side. Um, in Spain, one of the unique things they do is they teach like angle attack. Like so, you hit like a cross court angle and cover the line for the volley. Like that. That's something relatively unique to Spain. I mean, other countries, I'm sure, teach that as well. But that's something you see a little more in Spain rather than in the U.S. I speak from a U.S. perspective because I'm an American coach. We are typically trained, and coaches teach to attack down the line. Uh, tip, like approach shots should go down the line. Like how many, if you guys are coaches out there or, or you know, you take lessons in the U.S., this is like a, another myth, a big myth, uh, approach down the line. Like how stupid is that? Like what if the, what if the, re, the opponent has, that's their best side. Like what if they have an amazing back end? So if I get a short ball, I'm going to go down the line to their back end? No, I'm, you know, I'm going to, obviously I should, you have to have some variety. Sometimes you have to go to a, someone's strength. You have to mix it up. You know, you can't always go to someone's weakness either, or they're going to be waiting for it. So, you know, you have to have uh, you have to be judicious. You have to be very selective in what you're doing and and responsible and 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 intelligent when you attack the net. Um, the angle approach is very common in Spain. I don't know if that that may be more common in the clay court. Uh, clay court regions of the world. I know in Spain, the the idea of opening up the court and then moving in is um, you see it more frequently. You see it taught more frequently. There, there's not this like um, mandate that you gotta go down the line. You know, like every approach you go down the line, slice the back end and come in, uh, up, attack up the middle sometimes to take away the angles. These kind of these are in my mind kind of like old school myths from Australia or England or California. And the California will be like fast outdoor court anywhere where there's like fast courts and a history of attacking the net. Those strategies might work on a on on a very fast surface against a certain style of opponent, but not gonna be you know they should be taught with with more context and more um, more nuance. You know, you, coaches should explain those. Uh, the, you know, this will work the way I'm doing. It. Like this, this will work better uh, against this type of opponent uh, on this type of surface. You know, m most of the kids who I meet, they have no clue about any of that. They're like, I just play the same way on every surface. My coach told me a short ball, I should go to the net. My coach is working on my slice back and approach. And then I volley deep. Um, that's another thing that it's not really a Spanish thing, but I see it all the time. Huge myth to, I, I've probably done a podcast on this uh, a year or two ago, but 
I'm sure we talked about volleys and volleying deep is so overrated, like huge myth. Like you go in to the net, you volley deep, and then you look to finish at the net. Like that rarely happens anymore. You know, you see the way I want my players to come to the net is you use that Spanish forehand, rip that midcourt ball, do some, do some damage, move in, put away the high ball or the low ball short. So you're always looking to angle and go short with the volley rather than um, volleying deep. In today's game, in my opinion, as soon as you volley deep, as soon as you float a volley deep or you, you volley deep, you almost always lose that point. Now, I don't know if I have the, uh, the uh, data, the statistics to bag. You'll have to ask Craig O'Shaughnessy, although I don't trust his data that much, but, um, or his analysis. Uh, oftentimes, but um, he has some good things to say too. But volleying deep, you always get, you almost always get burned with, with someone who's a good counter puncher. Uh, so you usually get burned with the lob. So you get burned upstairs, or you get burned, you know, left to right. Um, so I always teach my players when they come in after that big forehand. We're talking Spanish forehand. Uh, what the shot that Tony Nadal says is the most important shot in the modern game. You can we can debate that too, but he says that clearly. You know, he says the forehand is the dominant shot in the game. Um, obviously, most people are going to say the serve and return are are the most important. But uh, Tony, this is the Spanish way. The forehand. If you have a big forehand weapon, you can dominate your opponent. And so that, and in terms of going to the net, you use that big forehand to to uh, do damage, move in behind it. And then you pick off an easy volley and you angle that volley. You power it angle. If it's high, you power it uh, on an angle for a winner. Or if it's low, you hit a nice angle drop shot or something like that. You know, you should almost never come to net and uh, t get balls that you, you don't never want to volley off your shoelaces or off your, off your feet, off your toes, off your socks. Um, that's another thing. You see, I see a lot of players who come to me and they say, uh, my volley is really not that good. And when I watch them play points, they, it's really their decision about when to come to net, their approach shot, approach shot decision. That's what's really not good. And they just end up having to make like a lot of really difficult volleys off their socks, which is, you know, guys used to do that serving and volleying back in the 70s and 80s. But it's not really, a, it's not a responsible way to go to net now in the year 2000, you know, 21 and 2022 soon. The responsible way to go to net is to build the point structure the point, rally, work the ball around the court, body shots, low kicks, you know, MMA style. And then if the opportunity arrives, uh, arises with the short ball, you take that big forehand, heavy, move in, easy volley. That's the way. That's the Spanish way. That's the way I will teach all my students. You know, I'll teach 99, all, all of them. I want to teach them to be responsible. And, you know, another debate point, like, I, I much rather have a kid, like, what do you teach first? Do you teach the volley first? Do you teach the backcourt first? Got to teach the backcourt first. Don't be like me with my dad. He had me up at the net at eight or nine years old, just working on my volley. Big mistake, dad. You know, work the backcourt, work, um, get the kids solid, and then, you know, start to build their attack, forehand attack, do they have that big foreign weapon, and uh, and then teach them to volley with, with angle, with short angle, you know. Uh, that's the way I see the, the net game. That's the way in Spain they, they generally, you know, I can't speak for every Spanish coach, but, you know, just in general, you know, the, the, uh, the, the basic philosophy is going to be something along those lines. Uh, and not the myths and the, the mistakes that I mentioned earlier in the program. Um, well, a couple more things that I wanted to add before I go night-night. we got a good show for you guys tomorrow as well. But, um, yeah, the, the, um, how, how, should you teach, how, how should you teach a kid? Okay, take this example. You have a, a kid, and you get, you get these kids. Like if you have... Uh, 100 kids coming into, onto your uh, coaching court, 
or parents, if you, you're going to see this too with your kids. Out of, out of every 100 kids, there's going to be, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them. I call them magicians. And they have a certain personality style where they're going to be all court net players. And you, you're going to see it right away with young kids. And you have to identify those kids and you have to give them a little more leeway to be creative, to go to the net and like do like their magical things, like break out the Ginsu knives and start, you know, doing cool stuff at the net. I'm thinking of like my boy Ty Switzer, for example, who just, uh, who just signed or verbally committed to UVA. Congratulations, Ty Switzer, a kid that I coached for a few years when he was little, great, great little baller unbelievable talent at like 9, 10, 11, incredible. Anyway, Ty Switzer, congrats, buddy. That kid had the magic. You know, he had the magic hands like a little Roger. You're not going to take a kid like that and say, okay, uh, you need to stay back the, all the time and uh, you can't come to net very often you're just not going to lecture a kid like that. It's not going to work. Like you're going to, if it does, if you force them to stay back so much that they can't be creative and they can't use like their uh, Filipino knife fighting skills at the net, like they're going to be very unhappy little prodigies. So everything I just said, like the whole show, uh, you can kind of flip it on its head. If you have a kid who's, who's got the magic hands, who's a creative uh, whiz, wonder kind. Uh, there's a certain type of personality. Uh, there's a certain type of personality. James, I'll get to that question in a minute. A certain type of personality that you're going to allow. You still have to teach them to be responsible, but you've got to give them more leeway to move to the net and have fun up there and experiment up there or you're going to lose that young kid. So that's my, I guess that's a good like end of the show caveat. Like most kids should be like in the back, grinding, learning to be solved because that's how you're going to get a lot of junior trophies and win a lot of tournaments and get your ranking, get your UTR up and get to nationals. That foundation is super critical. It's even critical for the magicians, but there's going to be, you know, 10, 20% of the kids they're very, very special. They have a, a unique desire to be creative. It's, it's in their DNA. And the way that you can, the way that those magicians like to be creative is like they like to go to net. They like the action. They're kind of like casino kids. Like they're, they're kind of like gambler. They also, some of them are like gamblers, like their personality. Like they like to be at net. Like they like the action of the net. Like some people like the action of a casino, which is not good, uh, not a good habit. Uh, they like the action up there and they need, they like need that action. You can tell those kind of kids, you have to identify them. If, so if they need the action of the net, they need to gamble. You have to try to make it like healthy gambling. So you, you work on their selectivity, you work on them being more mature and responsible in their movements to net. You try to get them to go to net behind like their big weapon, like the forehand. But at the end of the day, they're going to create more. They're going to play more all court stuff. They're going to go to net and like try the, you know, the, the 360 drop shot backspin volley, you know, the, the diving volley like Becker, you know, like there's, there's kids who are like that. So you have, cause if you, if you, if you pull like a Mr. Bruguera on those kids and you lecture them about how they're small and that they can't do it, like it's going to backfire and that kid's probably going to hate you, uh, whether you're a parent or a coach. And they're gonna they're gonna lose some of their joy. Like they get, sh you can see it in their faces. Like if you're a good coach, you know. Uh, hopefully the kids aren't masked because you can't learn anything from a kid if they got a mask on their face. Anyway, sorry. Uh, you know, you can't. You have to see their face to teach them well, and you have to feel like they have a joy when they go to net. And those are the kids you got to give a little more leeway to make more. Uh, you know, to be a bit more aggressive. But, you know. On the flip side, you get those kids who are super, super conservative and they, they only go to net to shake hands. You got to watch out for like that group of kids because those kids are going to need some prodding to be more aggressive. So uh, this is where the, the art of coaching comes into play and you have to have a lot of experience working with a lot of different personalities. Like you can't learn how to coach for just from a book or a video. You have to like work with, you know, thousands and thousands of kids and like you identify their, their, uh, 
I'm snapping my fingers here. You identify their personalities really quickly, and then you can you can kind of define the parameters for their uh, to structure their lessons and what you're going to teach them uh, based on on the way they they learn and the way you know they're going they're going to grow up and what they're going to be. Uh, so you know, those are like some parting um, words of wisdom and caveat. So I, I think in general, most kids should be taught uh, a conserv- relatively conservative Spanish way. And then you're going to have some special kids who uh, need to, to gamble. They need to have fun. They need to uh, get that rush of joy and adrenaline going up there and, and, and having some quick exchanges and doing some magic up there. Nothing wrong with that, as long you know you tr- and then you, you just try to guide those kids to make responsible decisions. You say, hey, you know, you can do all that great stuff, but try to come in, you know, this, you know, try to do, try to come in with your strength, try to rip that approach shot. Don't don't chip, don't float the ball and, and run in and, and on a kamikaze mission and try to like, you know, do some kind of crazy stuff up there. Make make sure you, you, you make sure you come in after building the point. Don't saber. You know, like it, you sh- you're gonna get kids who want a saber. You, you got you got to try. You know, there are kids like that. You know, occasionally get kids like that. But you gotta try to you know help them to make healthier decisions. Try not to saber, buddy. The saber is like the sneaky attack by Roger, where he takes the return <laughs> off the service line and half follows it and runs to the net. Like you might have to let a kid saber once in a while, but don't let a kid saber too much. <laughs> encourage them, guide them to be more patient, more conservative, more judicious, more thoughtful, more selective, more responsible. These are the words that I use with children. Uh, and, and, and maybe most importantly, to understand that the net is uh, not always a good place to be. The net can be a, a place where you lose a lot of points quickly. It can be a place that benefits you in a match, and you can win points quickly at the net, but you can just as easily lose points quickly at the net. Most kids, at least American kids that I see, do not see the net that way. Um, and once kids understand that the net is like a double-edged sword, they will. You can that can be the beginning of of helping them to make more responsible decisions when they go to net. Hopefully, the Spanish way. Um, so I was just going to answer James's question. James had some really good questions and uh, comments tonight. He said, Djokovic has one of the best backhands in the world, yet he runs around his backhand to hit forehand. Why does he do that? And that's a really common question. I talk about that question with my students a lot. It's a great teaching point, you know. Even if you have an uh, incredible backhand, the forehand, you can get more RPM. Typically, pros uh, run around their backhand to get more RPM. RPM is uh, revolutions per minute or RPS, revolutions per second. And the forehand just, just biomechanically uh, generates more uh, top spin than the backhand. So in terms of a strategy, using that inside out, inside in forehand or the inverted forehand, the drive invertido, as they say in Spain, the, dri- the inverted drive, uh, that's a really common teaching staple in Spain. And, and it's everywhere now. It's all over the world now. But I think Spain really was one of the first uh, countries to like systematically teach that to all the players. Tony Nadal systematically teaches that, you know, to, to use the forehand, even if you have a good backhand. And I think the main reason is you can kick it up high. You can play heavier with the forehand. So against certain types of players, that heavy ball is more important than hitting the, the, the more linear uh, backhand. Uh, so, that, and, and um, you know, it depends on the speed of the court. Usually... If the court is faster, you will see players playing uh, less inverted. Uh, when the court is slower, and if you're if you're a quick player like Djokovic, it's very easy to to go inverted and to play inside out, inside in, um, and to use your heavy forehand. So I, I think James, that's really the main tactical answer is because they can generate more uh, top spin and hit the ball heavier. So pros like to set up in that corner and use that heavy ball maybe to set up the back end later or to set up beforehand where they could go to net judiciously. Keyword, going to net responsibly. Guys, uh, great late night show. I appreciate everyone who tuned in. We had a, uh, actually a nice small audience. And we had some good questions from James. Good comments. Appreciate that. Thought we touched on a lot of uh, interesting topics, probably some controversial topics. Hopefully you guys are, are not, not hating me. 
uh, because th what I, a lot of the, some of the things I'm saying are, are not what you typically hear uh, from coaches and and especially American coaches or, or uh, uh, British or Australian coaches about going to the net. But you know, I think we gotta kind of move move uh, forward, and and the game is evolving. And as coaches and uh, any parents watching, you know, like we we should try to uh, evolve the way we teach the net. Uh, I don't know if we're ever going to go back to the old days where, you know, like uh, excessive amounts of serve and volley and, and um, where the old strategies m m will work again. It it it's possible if, if the courts get really fast again, you know, um, maybe, maybe some of those uh, old styles of attacking the net and those old strategies will, will work better. And then I would adjust my teaching then. But the way the game is now... I feel very comfortable teaching the kids this, the Spanish way to attack. And I think they build like a really good foundation that way. And I don't feel, I have no qualm at all teaching a kid to be a bit more conservative and responsible in general. And just to understand that the net cuts both ways. It's a double-edged sword. That That is, a, I think, a very reasonable position for a coach or a parent uh, to take with uh, when, they're, when they're guiding a young player. Um, so, you know, those are those are the, really the most important takeaways, I think. So, guys, thanks for joining in. Um, if you are in the, you know, if you're in the, the U.S. and you're interested in, in uh, coming to the club, we are in Manchester, Vermont. I have players visiting almost every week now to, like, this little oasis in the mountains, my, my own, my home, my tennis home in, in uh, outside of Manchester, Vermont. A uh, beautiful small town, like um, small ski town, really, really charming place. Uh, we have snow, <laughs> it's uh, blanketed in white snow right now, but uh, we, st we are training indoors, obviously, but we're training the Spanish way indoors. Uh, players from all over the country coming here to the this little town in the mountains of Vermont, uh, coming to train with me personally, one-on-one, -on -one and uh, either privately, semi-privately, and I love that. I would love to see more of you coming for a visit. So keep that in mind if you enjoy the show and you would like to train with me personally. I like to train one-on-one, -on -one and I like to train and consult uh in the, either in a very small group or or uh, or privately, so that's what we specialize in here. And um, I would love to see you guys coming for a visit and and enjoying this uh, this beautiful area that we have here up in the mountains. It's a very special place to uh, to uh, to visit and to uh, we have a club 100% dedicated to uh, to my players. So that is also um, something that's very unique. We are not um, not pushing a lot of pickleball, for example, at my club. The club is dedicated to my junior players and all of the all of the players who come to visit. We do get some competitive adults who come to visit and train with me, but primarily uh, we get serious juniors. Occasionally, I will accept serious adults. So, if you are a serious adult and you want to learn the Spanish way and train like a beast, you are also welcome to hit me up, and uh, we can. We can talk about your training as well, but you better be ready. All right, guys, have a good night. I'll try to see you uh, soon with the next program. I know you're probably uh, interested in learning about taking the ball on the rise, the Spanish way, positioning the Spanish way. Let's talk about that in the next episode. Have a good night. God bless.